I think <laughs> that we've known each other for almost 40 years, I think, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And so here Hard we are. Hard to even say that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, and I, uh, yeah. I have been fascinated with your journey from when you were in <laughs> Sacramento and the the odyssey that you've taken. Living which, down the street from your ex-husband. Uh, that's right, <laughs> my in-law. Um, the odyssey that you've uh, taken to bloom in the way that you have. Mm. And so, and the enormous effect you've had on the somatic community. Mm. And so I, I'm, I would like to rewind and go and, mm. and have you take us through the kind of progression. Mm. Now, if I recall, you had asthma when you were mm -hmm. uh, young. Mm -hmm. And so did that have any effect on mm -hmm. you, the eventual um, moving into more mm -hmm. somatic mm -hmm. uh, practice? And, and can you speak to that at mm -hmm. all? Yeah, I had serious asthma for 20 years. Wow. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't run half a block without getting attacks. So I... Um, I mean, a strange thing that's come to me in the last few months is that I've successfully negotiated a life of extreme restriction. So I had both the asthma and then I had a spinal, that's this anomalous spine where I had no movement. So was, they put me in the hospital early on when I was a child. What do you mean? Yeah. What is There's that? No, there was no, uh, um, the spinal discs were bridged when I was born. So oh. there was no movement, no, no serious movement in the spine since I was an wow. infant. Wow. Um, but, no, but nobody noticed this. They thought at first I had spinal meningitis and I didn't, so that was the end of the story. Mm. Until, until 30 years later when I got into the somatics field, everybody says, you're so rigid. <laughs> Whereas before I thought it was dignified. And <laughs> 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 yeah, dignified and elegant. Um, so yeah, I couldn't, um, so I, in my first 20 years or so, I couldn't really do much of anything <clears throat> physical. So it kind of drove me inward, and I felt quite clumsy and, uh, mm -hmm. and unable to do stuff. But the strange thing was, when I entered the Jesuits... Okay, I want to stop there. Yeah. Because <clears throat> how did you get from point A to point B? Because this is a very important thing oh, the of you being yeah. a Jesuit yeah. priest, right. and then the, the, this, this dismantling mm -hmm. or disrobing or yeah. whatever you want to call it. But yet, <laughs> Not disrobing, no. <laughs> but yet, you know what, I've always felt that, and I've, I've told you this, that you're still in a Jesuit serving hu humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're mm -hmm. still in that because the Jesuits mm -hmm. do do that. Mm -hmm. but, I, but this is a very important thing. So mm -hmm. can you take us to, even though I know you've written, you know, your mm -hmm. biography, but mm -hmm. still, you know, from this point of view now, you can update it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, from right. where you are now. Yeah. So, so c take us from being this internalized uh, young man uh -huh. to, and you were born Catholic. Yeah. And you went to that church. And that, I was uh, born in a working class family. That's right. Just coming out of the Depression. And nobody had ever gone to college. Mm -hmm. And um, and you're an only child, and right? And I'm an only child. And um, st still to this day, most of my extended family have not gone to a university. Some of them gone to city colleges, but nobody ever mm -hmm. went to university. So the idea of uh, anything other than a working life was not a reality in my future. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the same time, so there was that kind of world I was growing up in, but at the same time my restrictions um, kept me home most of the time, so I ended up reading endless books and mm -hmm. I went into a kind of a world of, of fantasy and some of the most inspiring things I read were people like um, St. Francis mm -hmm. and um, uh, began to ignite some sense of, uh, of a visionary life. And I had, you know, lots of wild dreams, and I would go into church, and I would have kind of. So you were um, cold in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think, and think you because still I are. had such an inner life. There was nothing. I, I I wasn't able to play games and sports and all that stuff. Right. So I was just by myself and quiet a lot. And my mother was never talked, and so we had a really quiet house. She didn't talk. Not much, no. Really. Um, you know, and, um, so I had a lot of grew up in a lot of silence and inwardness. Hmm. And. Um, I didn't like the world of commerce and 
hard work. I worked every summer, and eventually, when I was in high school, I started working in heavy construction in Sacramento. And you were doing heavy construction even though you had the asthma and the spine. Yeah, and I, I by that time I had gotten drug control of you know taking Benadryl and things like oh. that, so I could modulate the. And didn't one of your relatives do construction? Was well, my father had your father, in, yeah, and my grandfather. They were all in construction. The Johnson brothers, the, <laughs> Johnson <laughs> and son. <laughs> Uh, so well, they, the built, they built a lot of the original houses that are still standing in Sacramento. And they're still standing, so that at least is yeah. a good, you know, no, a good review. No, no, they're they did wonderful houses. Okay, so um, you're there with the nails and the hammer. Yeah, right. I'm there with the nails and the hammer, and I went to college uh, with the idea of being an engineer and taking over my father's business. That's so. That's but all he he never told me that. He just said, "Why don't you go to college?" Uh, I didn't realize that part of the bargain, and. Um, so I got to college. Now, if you can imagine me at this point, here I go to college. And we had class six days a week, and we were doing things like spending six hours drawing gears with India ink on vellum. Gears? Gears. Gears. Gear chains and. Oh, you mean struts. it was that kind of college? It was engineering oh, college. Oh, engineering. Oh, 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 oh. It was uh -huh. actually it was the beginning. It was the pre-Silicon Valley. All a lot of a lot of my classmates, you know, started the Silicon Valley thing. Oh. So. All day long, we you know we're tearing apart concrete piles and analyzing what happens with concrete. Oh, this is what I did for four years. I didn't know that. And so I just was so depressed. I thought, how am I going to live my life like how this? How old were you at this point? Well, I was a college age, so it's between so 20 seventeen and twenty-one. Uh -huh. And um, I, uh, I thought, I'm going to live like this? I can't see it because at the same time, I was fascinated by theology. I was fascinated by Greek tragedy. My roommate was a humanities major, which I thought was totally hedonistic and self-indulgent, but I loved everything he was reading. And um, the Jesuits were fascinating to me. They were, you know, they were world travelers and they had this vision of service and they were scholars and excited. So they were the only adults I ever met in my life that were interesting to me. So I uh, drifted through, struggled through this four years, just saying, oh, well, this is it. And I was drinking more and more, actually. Oh, you are? It kind of yeah. runs in your family, doesn't it? A little mm, bit. Not really. No, no I thought not it really. did. I'm no. sorry. Um, well, it did in the sense that climate was alcoholic. Like my mother never drank, and my father at 60 just stopped instantly. And oh. So it wasn't a huge problem. But you were indulging. But I was starting to indulge, and um, so as I got to graduation, I got offered a really good job with Westinghouse as a management training program in the East, and I went back there and. Um, it just got. I thought, how how am I going to live this life? I mean, I, there was nothing pulling me at all. What then, about women? Did that was that anywhere? Well, on the I, I can't. When I look back on those days, I'm kind of amazed at how deep the repression was. Uh huh. And you know, I look back now, and one of the worst things that ever happened to me, and I just can't believe that people do this to children, is my parents were not big hell and brimstone people, nor they. But I caught on to the idea of hell early on, when I was quite young, and I would wake up in the middle of the night terrified that I was falling into this pit that I would never get out of. Oh. And uh, I thought, you know, I was terrified of hell, that if I ever oh. stole a cookie that I wasn't supposed to eat, I might burn for all eternity if I died in the middle of the night. Huh. So the repression, I don't know if it hits, although I have talked to some men in later life who grew up like I did, and maybe you've met some in your in your work workshops who are of my generation. That um, the fear of hell was so great that mm -hmm. um, it, um, it it was extremely repressive. So I was always on guard at uh, mm. getting too far involved. Well. Um, well, I just want to ask you something because you know we've known each other a long time, mm -hmm. and I'm also. And we actually went to Assisi together when we were oh, in Rome, right. we which was yeah. really yeah. one of the highlights of the trip. That's right, I forgot about that. But, um, yeah. uh, I mean, you've always, I thought, you've been a very attractive man. Hmm. So, uh, you know, were women not kind of, I mean, I'm just sort of interested, you know, in terms of the odyssey that you've been on, um, so that didn't, it was still the hell thing. And Well, uh, uh, since you're bringing up the topic, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say that the whole world I grew up in was so repressed about, you know, I fell in love with girls and we kind of rubbed against each other and there's always kind of moving around. 
but there was a certain relief when I entered the Jesuits and became a celibate. Um, and um, I'd say for 10 years, I did not even have, unlike many of my colleagues, mm -hmm. even the slightest desire to violate the rule of celibacy. And the first time it happened is when a friend of mine, a Jesuit friend of mine, took me up to uh, Perry Lane to one of the psychedelic people from Ken Kesey's group, and we smoked marijuana. And the effects of the marijuana was, I was smoking marijuana, and I said, well, there's nothing to this. The only thing is I had this huge erection, <laughs> and I was obsessed with this woman walking through the, the room. You know, that was the beginning of the end. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the, between marijuana and psychedelics, which many of the Jesuits, older Jesuits, were taking at that time. Really? Uh, cracked the celibacy, cracked the repression. Right. So it was, it was then that suddenly this well, well of uh, stuff came libidinous out. Libidinous. Libidinous. Pulsations yeah, took just, over. It was kind of amazing to see how it, it suddenly welled up in that way after so long. But, you know, I mean, I just want to, you know, pause for a moment because, again, my experience of you is, again, that you're still a Jesuit in the best sense of the word, mm -hmm. meaning serving humanity mm -hmm. and, and the kind of consciousness that you have. It's just that the, 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 the dressing is gone mm -hmm. and the... Um, well, the, the Jesuit dressed a little bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. But the, and the celibacy and the, you know, that, but the yeah. underlying... Uh, the underlying impulse mm -hmm. of service and of humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just see you as a you know without you mm -hmm. know without mm -hmm. the without the window dressing, but mm -hmm. still with the same mission. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mean, do you think people are called into doing what they do? Oh, I do, and I, I love being in the Jesuits. It was just a fabulous, wonderful group of people, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it was a golden age in some ways. I mean, like we we had all these fabulous. Uh, just for one example, three or four of my classmates were in film school at USC. Mm. And um, so when we eventually got together for theology, we would have these film seminars. And we looked, we, we would, in the afternoon, we would see a Bergman film. Mm. And then we'd have dinner, and in the evening, we'd see it again. And then we'd have a discussion. We saw all of Bergman, Fellini. Oh, great. Uh, all of the great films of the 60s that were coming out of Europe. And uh, it was fabulous. And it was just one thing after another like that. And mm. all the social movements with Cesar Chavez and the anti-war movement. And it was an incredibly vital, fabulous. Wow, uh, yeah. My experience mm. with the Jesuits also, I taught at a seminary, I don't know if you remember, in Ohio. And it oh, was... Oh, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, and, and it was... That a, guy that, that one guy that we eventually yeah, got to... Yeah, and it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, I mean, and I yeah. found that they were just com very... But yeah. anyway, when you realize, um, under the influence of narcotics, uh, of your libidinous... Well, let me back up just a little okay, bit please. more because there is a crucial piece in here that Michael Murphy always re reminds me of. Um, <laughs> in my novitiate, I had a very weird master of novices, uh, Healy, who uh, on the one hand is extremely conservative Catholic, but on the other hand, he was obsessed with the bodily aspects of mysticism. Oh. And he was reading to us every day the same books Michael Murphy was reading about the bodily, at the same age when we were like 22, about the bodily transformation in mysticism. Wow. Well, we so just want every, to pause. Yeah. M Michael Murphy is the owner uh, of Esalen. Esalen yeah. Right. Um, and Michael and I have had this strange intersection of our paths for like all these many years wow. uh, where nobody else had ever knew about this stuff. Um, so what so was that? So he would say, if you, know, the, if you look at the, at the Bible, the Bible says uh, that we are all living, uh, th that these are immortal, our bodies are being transformed from sarks, which means stuff, meat, hunks of meat, into the immortal soma of Jesus, and that by uh, by the, all these religious practices, there's this stream of mysticism that says if we meditate, if we practice breathing, if we do all of these things, we're gradually transforming ourselves into the immortal body of Christ. So he was saying, you know, diet's important, sensory awareness is important, mm. posture, exercise, there's endless stuff, and all these books about trace of Neumann and uh, Angelo Foligno, who you know grew 12 feet when she was meditating. <laughs> I mean, these extraordinary uh, mm. stories about the importance of transformation of the body. 
So that was the beginning of the ideas of all of this. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So in Whoa. fact, when we were to CC, you probably don't remember this, but I, I do because I was tuned to it. They were carrying the immortalized body of Angela Foligno from one hill to another. It was her feast day. Oh. And they were showing her body to all of them. You know, she died 400 years ago, right? There's her, her corpse still. Oh no, I don't remember that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, so okay, so then, so that's very interesting. Yeah. So you were already being initiated yeah. into a bodily expanded awareness. And and Michael was at Aurobindo's ashram, where Aurobindo was saying the same thing mm -hmm. that all of these bodily techniques are are producing this different kind of spiritualized body, this mm -hmm. kind of luminous mm -hmm. body, and so. You know, mm -hmm. So that, that formed, as I think about it, looking back, the kind of conceptual apparatus that then made me appreciate, as I got further along the line, the transformative value of all of the things we do mm -hmm. and, and the role of sexuality and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that when you had this mm. erection, libidinous... Uh, <laughs> you would go back to that, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, no, I just... No, because transitions are very, mm -hmm. are very... Uh, I mean, I think it's monumental, you know, and in my knowing you, the level of transitions that you've been through mm. are so uh, compelling. Mm. So the transition of that awareness when you became sexually uh, awakened. Yeah. And so how did that... How did you... What happened... How did you segue mm -hmm, out of yeah. the Jesuit, and then did you you went into rolfing after that? Is that how that oh, worked? Oh well, no. Um, so um, just one thing I want to say as you yeah, ask please. me these questions. Yeah. I think part of why I have come to the positions I have about all this stuff, like you have, is that the I saw firsthand the radical difference between this kind of disembodiment mm -hmm. and embodiment. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people I know who just kind of live a fairly ordinary life, and it's kind of a, a, an ordinary progression. But for me, the disembodiment was so profound, mm -hmm. and then the, by contrast, the embodiment was so profound that I could see in clear outline mm. what the difference was. But I think is less obvious to mm -hmm. people who had a more ordinary <laughs> trajectory. Um, but so anyhow, in the uh, so uh, part of the golden age of this Jesuit period was the psychedelic part where uh, I, I went into the Jesuits because of mystical leanings, but there were no mystics in the Jesuits. It's interesting. So it had been all obliterated. It felt very sec it was beginning to feel very secular to me. Mm. But the first stage of recovery was, was the psychedelic revolution. Yeah. So uh, for example, uh, there was a famous old theologian named John Courtney Murray, who'd been condemned by, the, by Pius XII because he wrote a series of articles saying that democracy was a better situation for religion than uh, authoritarian governments because people then would be evoked out of freedom mm. to make decisions rather than the other. So he was condemned from that wow. point of view. So mm. when John Twenty Third became Pope, he was among those who was rehabilitated. So John Twenty Third celebrated Mass with him in St. Peter's in front of the whole Vatican Council. He flew from there to Los Angeles, where I was, and took LSD for three days in his room, and then came and talked to us about his experiences. So, you know, this was quite a big wow. thing. So, and then there were uh, Jesuit priests at UCLA doing uh, early experiments in LSD and consciousness. And so this was a whole environment. And, and I first took LSD in the middle of an eight-day retreat, you know, seeing Jesus, you know, making love to the universe and all that kind of stuff. And it was very bodily. The whole thing was part of the, you know, was kind of seeing the enormous. It was coming out of that framework of the transcendental meaning of bodily awareness. So there. Well, you know, I'm sitting here, and I'm as <coughs> you're speaking, I'm 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 retracing our steps to the asthma, mm -hmm. the what was happening in your spine, the mm -hmm. restrictiveness, the repression. Yeah the disconnect and the family not being particularly uh, bodily awakened in any way. Mm -hmm. And that how that awakening came to you, I mean, through the mysticism of mm -hmm. the, of the, the, the whole um, uh, re revelatory um, uh, em abundance, and then the trigger being LSD. I mean, it really is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it's, it's just pretty, yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you, I have to make a footnote. Yes. I forgot one important Oh, yeah, part. let's hear it. The, one of the more bizarre steps in this. So I took this job at Westinghouse. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was in the early days of doing these very refined instruments to, des to decide how, what you're fit for in the world, you know, these tests that go on for days. So we had three days of tests to determine where we would fit in the company. Oh, yeah? So <laughs> the guy calls me in and he says, well, we're very puzzled by the, re the results of your test because it turns out that you, <laughs> you should be a dancer. Isn't that? Uh, and we both laughed and said, oh, isn't that funny? Oh, that is so and they, interesting. And they didn't, uh, he says, I don't know quite how this is going to help us at all in deciding where you belong. <laughs> oh, that is... Isn't that, that interesting? Yes, it is. You know, at the time I thought, oh, this is just crazy, the test isn't working, but then I thought back on it, I thought, that's very interesting. That is. Yeah. So, so you went then, now you did do some dance. So what, how did that... When, uh, well... Yeah. Um, was it the rolfing first and the dance later, or at the same well, time? Well, it was the '60s, and I was living in New Haven, and there was a great scene in New York of Deborah Hay, and you know the whole Judson, Judson scene, and I'd married Alyssa, who was a Jose Limon dancer. Okay, so let's just pause for a minute, so that you. Um, oh, so yeah, there are steps we left. Uh, yeah, there's steps. There. Okay, so. So, uh, actually, so you actually got time, married at the at the same time that I was beginning to take LSD. I went to Esalen as part of my theology training. That was another great thing about the Jesuits. The Jesuits said we always, I always had to be out on the front lines of the and culture. And were you in the baths also? I mean, in the whole night. Oh, it was so frightening. I mean, <laughs> the first, my first trip to the baths, here I am, I've not been naked my whole life with other people, right? And I walked out of the baths and Fritz Perls is sitting there, you know, glowering. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to be kind of polite and social, you know. I said, well, hi, you know. And, and were you naked were, at the moment? Or you yeah, had well, I towel? had to. I had to take my <laughs> clothes off. And we were sitting in, the, <laughs> sitting in the tub, and I'd gone with this Jesuit friend of mine, right? And we were both sitting there in the tub, and this woman across from him picks up his feet and puts his feet on her breast, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, fuck, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> this is driving me. But it was a fabulous weekend. Houston Smith had just come back from Tibet, and... Stanley Coleman was just a participant in the workshop. Oh my! And, uh, uh, Will Schutz and Jafu Fang, and it was kind of a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. and discussing uh, Houston was discussing all of the early psychedelic experiments at Harvard, and that he'd been in. And um, so uh, that was in the middle of it. And um, where do you want to go from here? Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, just the the immersion, and 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 uh, okay. So then you meet Alyssa. So, so, yeah, right. So I, uh, I that went from, uh, so I was in the Jesuits. Was that your first girlfriend? So, well, I don't know how much I want to say on camera. Okay, okay, that's uh, fine. But no, I'll say it on camera and see if it, you know, you can do what you want with it. But, uh, <laughs> no, I ended up uh, having other... Uh, relationships. Relationships with, uh, in this taking of LSD with these people that I was with. They were illicit, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> and uh, it was quite amazing to me. I mean, it was really pretty profound. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that kind of led to my demise of the Jesuits because um, mm -hmm. um, although I loved the Jesuits, the, the barriers of celibacy were getting obviously crazy. And so I, uh, I, uh, the other part of this I haven't said much about is that um, when I entered the Jesuits, one of the most exciting things to me about the Jesuits was discovering humanities, because mm -hmm. I, I, I had little glimpses of it in high school and then at college on the ed edges, but I just love studying language and I loved uh, uh, studying uh, philosophy and literature. And so that set a whole track going. Mm -hmm. I just, it just was so fabulous to me to discover the, the whole history of, of people, you know, working out what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And so I w really wanted to get my doctorate in philosophy, and I ended up getting a fellowship to Yale, and I sort of segued into, I went as a Jesuit for my first year at Yale, and uh, Bill Coffin was chaplain, and I was the first um, Catholic priest to be a pastor of a Protestant church. He made me assistant pastor of oh my goodness. Battelle Church at Yale. And I preached at Yale with Kingman Brewster and all that during the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam stuff. And um, then I met Alyssa at, uh, I brought Ramdas to Yale. I, I brought him there when he came come back from India. And I met, um, 
No, actually, I met Alyssa. I was doing a wedding for um, a commune. John Steinbeck III and I were co-officiating at a, a wedding on a raft in the middle of a pond <laughs> in New England with the Anonymous Artists of America. Sounds you know, like with, a Fellini movie. You know, the, backup, the backup band for The Grateful Dead was the Anonymous Artists of America. And so uh, here we were in this pond, here was Alyssa and her th three children, and I met her there and uh, moved in with her, and that was the end. But you were, uh, you started to mention the Judson Church and that yeah. time so in the she 60s. Was, she was a dancer, uh, a, a modern dancer, and um, spending a lot of time in New York, and so we went down to New York a lot and participated in a lot of workshops and dance. Yeah, but that was an extremely rich time. That's incredible I was in New time. York at that time, yeah, and, an incredible you know, time. involved there as well. And yeah. so, uh, so that, you know, that was a potent yeah. uh, brew there, yeah. cauldron of... So dance always became, from that time on, dance was really a major part, both of my experiential life, getting doing it, and then watching it and following it like Pina Bausch. And, mm -hmm. So I'd say it's one of the major inspirers. Of so life. how did you, uh, was, was rolfing, uh, oh, rolfing, was that, the, is that how that so rolfing, segue? So uh, rolfing, rolfing, uh, this, this will remind you of one of our connections. Um, one of my best friends in the Jesuits was Paul Hillsdale. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so Paul Hillsdale was a child prodigy, if you remember. He graduated from college when he was 17. Right, and you know he passed away. Oh, know? I do, yeah, yes. Yeah. And he was, you know, this kind of bent over intellectual and um, in my final years of theology uh, we were having theology in Los Gatos in the Santa Cruz Mountains. He was given a scholarship by Mike Murphy to be in the first resident program at Esalen. Oh really? So he would be at Esalen all weekend and come spend the weekend with us and um, Ida Rolf worked on him and he became this wild animal, you know, this kind of vibrant <laughs> kind of I said, who is this woman? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, this is extraordinary. So uh, I finally managed uh, at one point to get, get my rolfing, and um, it just was fabulous. It was you know, kind of parallel to the experience of LSD in the sense that it, the, the opening was so pow, it was just so big, and feeling breathing and feeling my legs, like my first session was very revelatory in terms of its repression. It felt, I felt, as soon as he put my hands here, his hands here, I thought I was going to die because I thought I was like an eggshell, mm. an empty eggshell. Uh. And then to feel, it, I was filled with fluids and tissues and all that stuff. It was an amazing experience. So um, I just thought it was really a, such a fabulous experience. And then um, as I was doing my dissertation at Yale, I thought, why am I writing about this and talking about why don't I do it? And I went down and saw Ida. And, um, Did she take you? She, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, I, I tried to hide from her that I'd been a Jesuit, right? So oh, I was really? telling her about my career. And she said, what about all these big gaps? And, what about all those black and clothes? She was, and, yeah, and she wasn't. Well, no, this was, I was out of the Jesuits. I was with Lisa then. And, um, um, so I was trying to impress her with everything else, and uh, finally she, I said, well, yeah, I was in the Jesuits for 10 years. Oh, great! You're in Jesuits for 10 years. So oh, she liked me. that? Yeah, she liked that. She oh, good. That. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, so you did well. Yeah. So then you actually had, you yeah. actually functioned in the world for, uh, didn't you? Oh, for 20 years. Yeah. 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 And so, and then um, uh, you shifted. So, yeah, I... Uh, um, I loved rolfing so much, and I still do. I, the, after my fall, I, uh, mm -hmm. it's just incredible. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing thing. Um, I, um, I, I thought about what am I going to do? I don't want to do philosophy. Philosophy was in a terrible state in America right then. The analysts had taken over almost the entire philosophy world, and so it was almost impossible to do you know, interesting philosophy. I thought, well, what am I going to do? I was so taken with all of these, you know, things going on in the human potential movement. And I was so taken by Rolfing, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just try that. And, well, uh, listen, I had this notion of being vagabonds and taking our work around the world. And so uh, we moved to Santa Fe and uh, decided mm -hmm. we were to be a nice place to live with mm -hmm. our three stepchildren. And um, I trained with Ida and I basically gave up the intellectual life for about 10 years and just... I didn't read a book. I, oh wow! I um, 
you know, Rolf people for, and hiked through the Sangre de Cristos and just didn't go anywhere. And, <laughs> and it was quite a, it was almost like a retreat, mm -hmm. kind of regathering all of these resources. Um, and, um, but I began to, you know, be pulled by my deep soul of wanting to write and express and think <laughs> and all of those things. So gradually I started coming back to a uh, world of writing and thinking. And well, yes, you've written several books, uh, yeah. which we'll name on our, um, uh, on our announcement of you. But one of the things that I have been very struck with is that you became, from my perspective, a catalyst for bringing the mm. somatic community together. Mm -hmm. at Esalen where we had mm -hmm. so many meetings and I, I what was it 10 years or mm -hmm. yeah. and and I, I just so appreciated your role mm -hmm. because you were the you were the glue mm -hmm. that was creating this unified uh, field of inquiry mm -hmm. that w where we could listen to each other hear each other experience each other I remember mm -hmm. Tom Hanna I met him uh, mm -hmm. and we I, I experienced Feldenkrais there mm -hmm. and I thought wow you know Feldenkrais with a continuum body that's mm -hmm. really something mm -hmm. and so there was a way of cross-pollinating that mm -hmm. you did mm -hmm. that um, again I, 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 I had such gratitude in relation to the catalytic role that mm -hmm. you took on mm -hmm. as you went deeper into the whole soma everything and and mm -hmm. and you were so active in that mm -hmm. so do you want to speak to that at all yeah. i mean i think it's just yeah. so you know part of the purpose of the, this mm -hmm. is archiving mm -hmm. uh you know the elders and that people mm -hmm. who come after us have to know the history mm -hmm. of who were the sh movers and shakers and mm -hmm. how did it happen so mm -hmm. that we're not just stumbling over pebbles you know <laughs> <laughs> so i'm just right. saying <laughs> right well you know I, you probably don't know this i don't think i've ever said this to you but where this all started for me was in my home as a child uh, it was so baffling. So my father had no religion. My grandparents were nominally um, Lutheran, but oh. they never went to church in their entire life. And I never heard them saying a word about anything, grace or God or anything. And my father had absolutely no use for religion. And um, my mother was an Irish Catholic, and um, my father uh, had to sign a contract when he married my mother in the priest's house. They didn't let him marry in church because he was not a Catholic in those days. Mm. He had to sign a contract that I would be raised in my mother's religion. So first off, I was raised thinking my father was on his way to hell oh, right. with my mother. And then I was raised in a strange world where some of our relatives were non-Catholic and others were Catholic. And we couldn't go to weddings. We couldn't go to funerals. Really? And I thought... As I was growing up, I thought, you know, the teaching of Jesus is about loving everybody and unity and helping the poor and all that stuff. And I saw racism and I saw the divisiveness. So pretty early on, I got struck by the craziness of the fragmentation of people who seem to have very basic beliefs that are not strong enough to overwhelm the larger superficial mm. biases. So that happened pretty early on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it it got pretty clear. I had two or three teachers, both in high school and in college, who pretty much were nurturing that part of me, and, and you know, doing public writing and teaching mm -hmm. about the absurdity of all of these fragments. And then I was uh, one of the early people involved in the ecumenical movement. Mm -hmm. So when I was uh, in the Jesuit seminary, um, it was just the beginnings of people starting Protestant Catholic dialogues. Mm. And, like uh, the Sunnis and Shiites. That's kind of. right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. This is the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it just, you know, it, it just, to this day, it still baffles me how people of goodwill with profound things that bind them together can find ways to so profoundly right. fracture themselves. So. Uh, when I got involved with, um, so I thought, well, I'm leaving that world. I'm getting into, I'm getting into just down home grounded body work, right? And then Ida saying, you know, don't do Hatha yoga, don't do Feldenkrais. These are terrible things. They're going to ruin you. And, and Alexander's, he has the cervical vertebrae in the wrong place. And I thought, 
here I am again. Right. <laughs> and so that same kind of impulse. Uh, and Carl Rogers was a huge influence on me, mm. who was working from this viewpoint as well. You know, he developed the whole. He developed no, devoted his last lives to putting himself in Harlem and putting himself in Belfast mm -hmm. to try to bring together these people. And um, so I really, I, I, that was a there very, is a very deep thing in me to see. Well, now there are these profound human values that are getting just crashed on the waves of these superficial. Shores. That's you know that's <clears> so <throat> interesting because the impressions of childhood really propel us yeah. throughout the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. So now, um, and, and I just want, uh, I, again, I want to pay reverence to the fact that I met Charlotte Selva at one of our meetings. Oh, right, right. And, <laughs> right. and the opportunity, when I remember of our meetings, that they were generational uh, uh, moments. And I remember when we had scientists and uh, somatic people together, right. and you and I officiated at a, at that interracial night. Oh my God! <laughs> you remember that? And uh, because right. we felt that Esalen was, uh, you right. know, right. was racist and right. too white, right. and so right. we wanted to bring in, yeah. and they didn't want us to be in the room, if yeah, you right. remember right. correctly. Right. Right. And so, I mean, we've been through a lot, mm -hmm. but um, but I, I'm so struck with the impetus of the cloister childhood mm -hmm. and just the the fragmentation and and the enormous attempt that you've made to uh, create this integrated wholeness. I mean, the mm -hmm. dedication of your life, really. Mm -hmm. So, how did you get to a California Institute of Integral Studies? How did how did what was mm -hmm. that segue? Mm -hmm. So we uh, the way uh, I originally so I, I was had. After ten years in Santa Fe, Rolfing, uh, Alyssa and I looked at each other one day, and we said, well, "Our whole our original vision is we would travel lightly around the world." And here we've been ten years in Santa Fe, haven't gone anywhere. We didn't even travel anywhere, and so we said, "Let's take off." So um, we decided to go to to Europe for three months, and we got there. And this friend of ours who we met in Santa Fe was living in a, a borrowed apartment in Paris, and she said, you want this apartment? Um, I don't need it, and um, we could have it for four months. And then this woman, uh, Therese Bertra, had read my books, and she invited me to do rolfing in her studio in Montparnasse. And uh, so we were invited for a year. We had a, an apartment, I had a job, and we stayed in uh, Paris. And um, it was a really hard, it was a, a very important year, but very hard. Um, first of all, being in the middle of Paris and in the whole ferment of, of uh, Michel Foucault's work on the body and the whole ferment about the role of the body in society was very alive. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot from that. And from, you know, Derrida was there, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Lacan, Jacques Lacan. And I, you know, I was roughing all these intellectuals, Paris intellectuals, and politicians, and people from all over the world. And, so it was quite an education, but on the other hand, I was in desperate pain. Uh, this woman practiced um, a really crude version of rolfing that was came out of, of a France of a French physiotherapist. And one day, she knelt on my shoulders to straighten them out. And she I could, knelt on yeah, your shoulder, and I couldn't lift my arms more than this for a year. Actually, I was in constant pain. I couldn't sleep at night because I couldn't. Oh my, my sides. God! So and then Alyssa was. Uh, suddenly aware that she was an oppressed woman and she was running off into the middle of the night having affairs with everybody and I, uh, I was sitting here alone in our apartment with my shoulders. Was this a feminine revolution? This was a feminine revolution. <laughs> and, and Sartre died and I thought, well, you know, Sartre's right, the whole thing is a mass <laughs> And uh, So I started longing to return to teaching, which I'd loved when I was in the Jesuits. The happiest years of my life was when I was teaching at Loyola mm -hmm. University. And, um, teaching philosophy. And so my friend Will Schutz had just started a holistic studies program at um, Antioch in San Francisco. Mm. And um, mm. so I thought, well, I'd like to do that. And so I wrote to him and he says, come on. And so when I came back, I went there and uh, he was kind of cobbling together this thing of his general idea was to bring Esalen into the university world. So it was fun. It was a kind of a fun program, but it was the first couple of years. It, all those people who had money could do this, but then after that, we had to settle down to well, how can people make a living doing this? And uh, he left. He had a more lucrative opportunity, and um, uh, Michael Kahn and I uh, 
realized we could do a really good job of somatics. And so, uh, I mean, we named it somatics and uh, gathered all of these people we knew. And uh, Elizabeth Berenger was bringing all kinds of people from all over the world, uh, Berkeley and San Francisco, and mm -hmm. we got them to come there. Mm -hmm. So it started at Antioch, and then Antioch went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's a whole other s terrible story. Um, and we went whole, the whole bunch of us went to a place called New College, which has since went bankrupt. <laughs> and then uh, um, um, Lawrence Rockefeller gave a great deal of money to Robert McDermott to take over uh, CIS, which is about to go bankrupt. Really? Yeah. And Robert invited us to come to uh, bring our whole program to CIS. This was in 91. And so we went there, and it's been the best home for us, of any, because um, they, they understand the value of work, and it's a very visionary institution, and it's thriving, and so uh, it's, Okay, it's so, really <coughs> so, you know, you and I are the same age. We're just a few oh, months apart. I, right. your, your birthday's in April, if yeah, I right, right, yeah, right. and I'm in June, so yeah, right, you're a little right. older than <laughs> 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 But um, in terms of, I mean, one, one of the things that I feel, even though you've written uh, so many wonderful books and articles, so in terms of like in the odyssey that you've been on, you know, you know what is the, you know, what is the landscape, and mm -hmm. and how are you, how are you providing, giving, what what what, mm -hmm. what is important to you now? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I responded originally so powerfully to your work is that. My interests have not been particularly in therapy, mm -hmm. but in um, a transformation of our relation with the cosmos, mm -hmm. with other people, animals, the <laughs> heavens, all of that. That so, um, seems so important to me, both in terms of just personal meaning as well as the mess we're in in the planet. So my main interest is that kind of profound um, redoing of the self and community that happens when we go deep into breathing and moving uh, and just going all the way in, coming out of it. And um, it seems more important to me than ever as I mm -hmm. get older and I kind of drop away things that I'm not interested in. Um, that's kind of the core of it. Um, but you're writing articles now. Yeah. Uh, and so what, what, mm -hmm. is, uh, what is capturing you at the moment? Well. They're all kind of in this line, like one of one of them I'm in the middle of, I have to finish, it should have been finished last week, is oh. for uh, the Transpersonal Psychology Journal on the relation of a body practices to social activism, to spiritual social activism. Great. So I'm trying to make it, um, trying to make it clear how... Oh, how appropriate and timely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. You, you understand. Um, so I'm trying to make it clear, kind of weave these threads that I've been kind of following in my life to make Beautiful. it clear about how, you know, um, this is important work for the world. And it's, um, I mean, you know, your mission mm. has been so uh, that it has this movement to it, mm -hmm. you know, of but underneath it, the theme has always been there. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what to me is so moving about, mm -hmm. and privilege in knowing you, by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. is that, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, and so in terms of glimpsing into the future, mm -hmm. w you know, because we're archiving this for those mm -hmm. who come after us. Mm -hmm. So what, do, what, how do you, what would you like to leave in terms of mm -hmm. the, the seeding of what your life meant and those who will gaze upon your words, hear your words. Mm -hmm. There's a quote of Norman R. Brown's that I keep going back to. Mm -hmm. That's something like... I can't Love's remember. Body, yes. Love's Body. Mm -hmm. uh, that says, um, it's only in the body that we are one, mm -hmm. in um, ideas we are many. And that's such a reversal of my whole upbringing, that phrase. Um, but it's motivated me these many, many years. And, uh, this, my dissertation circled around that. It's, it's such an obvious idea to me now, at this point in my life, mm -hmm. that when we, uh, you and I, when we look at each other and feel each other, 
we can be here. If we start talking about <laughs> politics and philosophy, <laughs> <laughs> and, but you and I can get along pretty well, but uh, I mean, if, if the world has to depend on some kind of agreement, we're dead. Mm -hmm. So it's this level of feeling uh, where people awaken to the hunger of a child or the frailty of an older woman that there's hope for transcending these crazy ideas that fragment us. So for me, the more we can shift our, our energies from so much focus on what uh, divides us at the level of ideologies and more on our rootedness here and now and seeing, like Le Levinas has this, Emmanuel Levinas says, if we really see each other's face, can we really hurt each other? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So. And so we continue. So we continue. Well, I love you very much. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was great.